funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child, and RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, did you feel it? A 4.8 magnitude earthquake rattles New Jersey. Buildings, houses and residents shaken up after this morning's biggest earthquake to rock the East Coast in over 10 years. We're not exempt from the from the power and the impact of an earthquake. Also, Rutgers students call on the university to end its investments in Israeli based companies as the Israel Hamas war enters its sixth month. The community is upset, the community is grieving in many ways, and oftentimes when you'll see these outbursts, um, it's their pain that's coming out there that they don't have, a, they feel like they have a voice in, in the spaces that they inhabit. Plus, stopping squatters. We need to restore the rule of law and make sure that people respect the rule of law here in the state of New Jersey. Two Republican state senators push for new legislation to criminalize squatting, but tenant advocates and attorneys are pushing back. And eyes on the skies as Americans prepare for Monday's solar eclipse phenomenon. What are some tips to safely watch the rare event? NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Friday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. A 4.8 magnitude earthquake sent tremors through New Jersey this morning and rocked the Northeast Corridor from Maryland to Massachusetts. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, the quake hit at 1023 a.m. Its epicenter recorded near Reddington in Hunterdon County. Early estimates show it was felt by some 42 million people all along the East Coast who largely aren't accustomed to this kind of event. It rattled large buildings, it shook windows and cars, all for about 20 to 30 seconds. Governor Murphy took to social media, letting residents know the state immediately activated the Emergency Operations Center. Murphy also spoke with President Biden by phone, briefing him on the incident. 911 centers across the state reported being inundated with calls. So far, though, only very minor damage has been reported and no injuries. Assessments are ongoing. Globally, this level of earthquake isn't uncommon, but it was enough to unnerve a whole lot of tough Jersey residents. I was in a, I was in a building complex that was on the 35th floor, and it was definitely like a zero gravity moment. I moved from California. I thought I was leaving the earthquakes behind. My roommate was like screaming, so I felt bad, and I was like, what's happening? It's just the train. She was like, Chris, no. <laughs> It's an earthquake. I was not expecting it. I thought earthquakes were like a California thing, West Coast. I'm like, East Coast, we're fine. Well, besides the shock, flights were temporarily grounded in and out of Newark Airport. PATCO suspended service to check the integrity of the line. New Jersey Transit operated on delays while bridges were inspected, and the Holland Tunnel was closed to traffic for inspection. State Police Colonel Pat Callahan today said commuters, though, should rest easy. Yeah, I think they should be confident in our uh, in the inspections that have taken place so far. Uh, NJ Transit Transit has been out there inspecting their lines and, and bridges. Uh, I've been on with Port Authority multiple times, uh, aside from the the air train at Newark, which is delayed probably for another three or so hours. Um, all the bridges and tunnels on both the New York side as well as uh, Philadelphia. Um, in Pennsylvania and Delaware. So that regional approach to this earthquake uh, was almost immediate to watch that come together just to make sure that uh, especially our commuters were safe. No doubt, though, a historic day for the state. For more on that, we turn to Greg Pope. He's a professor of Earth and Environmental Studies at Montclair State University. <music> professor Greg Pope, uh, really happy to have you and your expertise on the show. Uh, what can you tell us uh, about the earthquake that we felt? How is it classified? And uh, when's the last time something like this happened? All right, so this it looks like this is centered on what's known as the Ramapo fault system. It goes um, kind of through north, uh, you know, northwest New Jersey. Um, it's a kind of a dividing line between 
the Newark Basin and the higher rocks, higher mountains in the northwest New Jersey. It's been there a very long time. It, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of years. It does shift occasionally. Uh, this is, uh, as far as shifting, um, it's kind of like maybe the higher end of what we would normally expect on this type of fault. Um, uh, you know, every few years we get, you know, earthquakes like this on, on this fault or, or ones nearby it. But um, ones maybe this strong or lengthy are, are not usual. So a little, little more time between those. Yeah, I think a lot of us were brushing up on our history of the Ramapo fault uh, line today and being the longest fault line in the Northeast. So what did that mean for the amount of people who felt it? And at a 4.8, um, what's the significance of that and the potential for damage? Right. So, yeah, th I guess there's some reports of minor damage around. Uh, I was looking at the uh, the Did You Feel It Shake map that you can see on the USGS website. It's as far as like central Pennsylvania up to New England, down to Virginia. So it's pretty widely felt. Um, it's a relatively shallow earthquake, only about, you know, less than five kilometers deep. The, the thing is with, you know, if this had happened in Wyoming or, or Utah or something like that, it would not be that big of a deal, but it's here in a pretty populous area of the Northeast. So a lot of people did feel it. Um, as far as it's, it's kind of widespread feel, um, because it was shallow, there might be, you know, kind of minor damage here and there. Um, what that, triggers you know, it, Greg? What what triggers an earthquake like this? Because, and you can certainly clarify, but it appears anyway that something of this significance um, hasn't happened, uh, or at least it's the strongest in the last 50 years. That's right. So, right, it's, there's nothing, this is not a tectonically active part of the country. We're not at a, we're not at a plate boundary like California or Utah might be, uh, where, where it's where there's tect more tectonic activity. Uh, it's this is simply the crust adjusting. It's an existing fracture, you know, a fault in the in the crust. So it it does adjust and and move. It's been you know, one reason it can do that is, um, you know, even 10, 20,000 years after the ice age, the crust around in the northeast is still slightly adjusting from the weight of the glaciers that were are no longer on us so that's part of it but it's it's just, it's normal kind of adjusting the the crust as it as it you know this part of the continent as it sags or shifts a little bit um, sometimes they're very minor things that you don't pick up and sometimes it may move a little bit more what's the likelihood then of this something of this magnitude happening again and of course we saw uh, major quakes happen in asia just uh, earlier this week so what's the likelihood for this happening again here which is i think what a lot of folks are wondering sure uh there there might be some minor uh, aftershocks but probably things that uh, most people won't feel uh, so to have something as strong or stronger would be really unusual and not likely at all. Typical when it comes to the scientific nature, rare for those of us uh, who've That's lived right. in this state our whole lives. Greg Pope is a professor of earth and environmental studies at Montclair State University. Greg, thanks so much. All right, thank you. An Israeli investigation confirms the airstrike that killed seven aid workers with World Central Kitchen violated the military's own protocols, admitting it shouldn't have happened. Two IDF officers have been fired from their posts, and three senior commanders were reprimanded for their roles in the drone strike that killed the workers. The White House today said it has no plans to conduct a separate investigation. The event has sparked fury from many of Israel's allies and from frustration here at home, too. Students at the Rutgers, New Brunswick and Newark campuses are voting to join other schools divesting from Israel, a significant move that has so far been resisted by the administration. Ted Goldberg has the story. Rutgers President Jonathan Holloway heard an earful at a town hall with the school's student assembly. And it made clear my view on TAU. South African and I made my. And I made my clear on Tel Aviv University and the fact that we're not separating relationships. Thirty 
Earlier this week, Holloway sent an email explaining why Rutgers is not planning on divesting from companies which have ties to Israel. He said the boycott divestment sanctions movement is, quote, wrong, and I believe in engagement, not isolation. I believe that enlightenment comes from involvement and that lasting progress and peace are the outcomes of diplomacy and discussion. The community is upset, the community is grieving in many ways, and oftentimes when you'll see these outbursts, um, it's their pain that's coming out there, that they don't have, a, they feel like they have a voice in, in the spaces that they inhabit. Kaiser Aslam is the Muslim chaplain for Rutgers, New Brunswick. He says students were told that last night's town hall would be open mic and there would be a question and answer format which ended after one question. We really wanted this to be a conversation for the president to speak to us and hear from us as well. Unfortunately, the night turned into just hearing from us and us not being able to engage in dialogue. Starting off from the standpoint of demand is not going to win the day. Starting from the place of we want to understand better, we want to collaborate better, we want to be partners, will get you a heck of a lot further. This week, Rutgers Newark students are voting on joining other schools in divesting and disassociating with Israeli universities. In the call for divestment, students write, quote, We value ethical responsibility over complicity in oppression in pursuit of divestment from Israel and its genocide in Gaza. We call on our university to reimagine an endowment fund free of investments in global injustice, one that can bring improvement to our community and beyond. Psychology professor Kent Harbour says divestment would be a huge mistake. This referendum is putting a whole domain of learning and a whole institution in an institutional ghetto. I, I don't believe in ghettos. My family came from them. They don't help. Harbour teaches at Rutgers Newark and co-signed a letter defending his school stance. Isolation of an entire country, an entire university, based on ideological and national and probably ethnic grounds. And for us, that is anathema to what higher education is all about. Harbour says the actions of Israel's government should be considered separate from Tel Aviv University, Israel's largest university, and a school moving into The Hub, a $665 million project in New Brunswick. The neuropsychology of different kinds of psychological dysfunctions, anxiety, uh, autism. These are things that, you know, as a psychologist, I need to engage in. Why would we not want to have connections with another institution in which we can do what we're supposed to do? Discover, learn, disseminate information. Oslam says Rutgers should sever ties because Tel Aviv University has supported settler policies that are displacing hundreds of thousands of people. So that's really where it's coming from. It's a moral imposition. Why would we want to have a relationship with an institution like that? For Rutgers to consider divesting, 10% of the student body has to vote, and a majority of them have to vote in favor. Results will come out sometime between now and next Thursday. In Newark, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. A union representing casino workers is filing a lawsuit against the state to put an end to smoking on casino floors, arguing workers are being denied their right to equal protection because of an unconstitutional loophole in the state's Smoke-Free Air Act. The suit names Governor Murphy and the state health commissioner, claiming they failed to protect the safety of casino workers. The lawsuit comes as legislation to ban smoking in AC casinos has stalled in Trenton. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. up dealers, servers and housekeepers sick of inhaling secondhand smoke at Atlantic City's nine casinos and tired of waiting for lawmakers to act, rallied at a Trenton courthouse where they filed a lawsuit today seeking injunctive relief. They want a judge to strike down the special exemption in Jersey's Smoke-Free Air Act, which makes casino workers almost the only employees forced to work around toxic smoke. Well, you basically stand in an area with everybody smoking around you and your head lower than them so every breath they exhale you take in. Holly's a craps dealer and multiple cancer survivor. She says it's not fair. I took a job with the expectations that the state would keep me safe. The UAW represents 3,000 Atlantic City casino workers filing this suit along with the group Cease, casino employees against smoking's effects. They warned politicians, gaming industry execs and other casino unions in New Jersey and across the nation. If the legislatures in these 
states will not stand up for the health and safety of workers, then we're just going to come after them legally. Come out into the light of day and tell us why we're worth less. Because if I can't smoke in your office, you shouldn't be allowed to smoke where I work. The lawsuit names Governor Murphy and Jersey's health commissioner. It argues exempting casino workers from the Smoke-Free Air Act violates their constitutional right to safety, illegally grants casinos exclusive privileges and immunities, and violates workers' rights to equal protection. These workers have been denied the right to safety that all other workers in New Jersey have. It's unconstitutional. So we're taking the fight from the back room to the courtroom. The union hopes this lawsuit will light a fire under Jersey officials. It earned them the support today of U.S. Senate candidate Andy Kim. You're taking it in your own hands. And you're taking it right here to the courts and say, you have to protect us. It is our constitutional right to be protected. And I'll be honest with you, I've had a little bit of experience lately with lawsuits and taking legal action. <laughs> and we won! Not all casino worker unions agree with the UAW. Unite Here Local 54 opposes a smoking ban. They're afraid that that kind of restriction would drive Atlantic City gamblers to go elsewhere. Efforts to pass a casino smoking ban have languished in the legislature, facing opposition from powerful gaming and business lobbyists. They argue a total ban could choke revenues and lead to massive layoffs. A compromise measure still permits limited smoking areas with 15-foot buffers and enclosed rooms where workers could opt out. Its sponsor reasoned... Well, this is about business preservation, job preservation, and moving incrementally to work, work environment that is going to be better. But the UAW cites studies showing more gamblers prefer smokeless casinos, once thriving in Pennsylvania, and they urged Local 54 to the membership of that union, stand up and tell your leadership enough is enough. Local 54 didn't reply to requests for comment. Senator Joe Vitale, who sponsored the total casino smoking ban, stated, we allowed corporations to poison their employees for nearly two decades. It's a shameful legacy for our legislature. But I'm grateful to everyone involved in today's landmark lawsuit. I pray the judge will see the merits of this case. The judge will set a hearing date. In Trenton, I'm Brenda Flanagan, and J Spotlight News. Two Republican state senators have introduced a bill that would criminalize occupying a vacant property. It's commonly known as squatting. The lawmakers claim squatting has long been an issue in New Jersey and want to give homeowners more protections. But some activists and attorneys are pushing back, saying it's not a widespread problem. The legislation, they say, is being fueled by fear-mongering over migrants. Melissa Rose Cooper reports. Everything of value was gone furniture. It appears they had little kids there. They looked like everybody was sleeping on floors. Uh, they stripped uh, copper out of the, uh, the heater, the hot water heater. A frustrating situation Nick DeGregory says he was forced to face after squatters took over the Burlington County home he and his siblings inherited after their aunt passed away. DeGregory says he first tried calling police about the situation, but was instead told to contact an attorney. I'm very surprised by the police uh, response. You know, basically, I learned it was a civil matter and not a criminal matter, which is hard to comprehend. I thought if you broke into a property, that's a criminal offense. But apparently, uh, if you set up shop and uh, when I say set up, you know, set up living there and there are no no trespassing signs uh, on the property, then it becomes a civil matter. Which State Senator Douglas Steinhardt says can take months or even years to resolve. Well, we have burglary, which is breaking into somebody's home for the purpose of committing a crime and trespass if there's no intent to commit a crime. Uh, but when the intent is to come in, break into somebody's house and then deprive them of ownership of it, uh, there's no there's no law in the books in New Jersey to criminalize that conduct. So Steinhardt is now co-sponsoring legislation along with State Senator Mike Testa that would make the unlawful occupancy of a dwelling a crime in New Jersey. It's becoming more and more problem and unfortunately as we're finding it's leading to other uh, unintended consequences where homeowners are being arrested for trying to reclaim their property and, and worse yet uh, people are, are are walking uh, unknowingly into a property that's occupied so I think we're seeing this uptick because there are hundreds of thousands if not 
not millions in the state in the United States of America and certainly thousands in the state of New Jersey residing here illegally. And now they're going to continue their illegal activity and try to seize someone's home. But critics of the legislation say New Jersey doesn't have an issue with squatting. And the real problem is the lack of housing. And immigrants are part of that housing crisis. It can be extraordinarily difficult to find secure and stable housing when you are a non-citizen. Um, the types of paperwork that's collected, the type of you know credit history, job employment checks, things like that. Um, and what we see time and again are landlords will use excuses to try and evict their immigrant tenants or to get their immigrant tenants to self-evict. Catherine Weiss believes the legislation is a fear-mongering tactic about undocumented people and is actually searching for a problem that doesn't exist. I wanted to dispel the idea that like somebody who lives in your house for a week may have the right to stay there. That is not true. It's also not true what the sponsors of this bill are saying, which is that let that owners, property owners have no recourse. If somebody invades your house and sets up, uh, you know, and, and, and starts sleeping there, there are two things already in New Jersey law that property owners can and should do. The first one is they should call the police. It's criminal trespass to enter property that you have no right to be in. Weiss says there's also what's called an ejectment action in place that calls for a fast proceeding, allowing the owner to get damages if the property has been damaged. Lawmakers supporting the legislation say they just want to make sure homeowners are fully protected. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. In our Spotlight on Business report, connecting wind energy to the power grid. With the state moving forward on wind projects, the next step is to make the power available to residents. The State Board of Public Utilities this week closed the bidding process for projects expected to bring about 6 gigawatts of power to the JCPNL substation in Howell. The BPU didn't disclose how many bids it's considering, but it's believed to have about four under consideration. That puts the agency one step closer to bringing 11 gigawatts of power to New Jersey by 2040, a major goalpost for state leaders. The project requires a 12-mile underground connection to link the JCPNL substation to a single facility in Seagirt, where the power will be sent from wind farms. The BPU is expected to award the project later this year. On Wall Street, stocks were sent rallying after a blowout March jobs report that was just a whole lot better than investors expected. Here's how the markets closed for the week. And make sure to tune in to NJ Business Speed with Raven Santana this weekend. April is Financial Literacy Month in New Jersey. Raven talks to educators and advocates about the importance of financial education, along with the programs available to improve your financial literacy. Watch it Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. on NJPBS. And finally tonight, if one natural phenomenon wasn't enough, a celestial rarity. On Monday, a total solar eclipse will pass over a large chunk of North America. A partial eclipse will be seen in New Jersey. That's when the moon temporarily passes in front of the sun, turning daylight to darkness. And it's a big deal because it's the last full eclipse of the sun to be visible anywhere in the U.S. until 2044. For serious sky watchers, you'll have to travel out of the state to get the best view. Upstate New York and northwest Pennsylvania are in the path of totality, but you can still get a good look, especially in North Jersey, where about 90 percent of the sun will be blocked at around 325 p.m. It's quick, though. You'll only see it for roughly two to four minutes, but that's still enough time to do damage to your eyes. Some schools are even canceling class over worries kids will look directly up at the sun. You can pick up a pair of those cardboard eclipse safety glasses to avoid that. NJIT professor Andrew Gerard is taking a group of students and faculty to view the eclipse in New York. For some, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. This one on April 8th is particularly special because it's going right through really Mexico, uh, the United States, Canada. It's that's why it's often referred to as the, the great North American eclipse. 
The Astronomical uh, Society, the American Astronomical Society has put out a list of different uh, eyewear to be used um, that meets their standards. It's frankly, it's it can be really tough to determine a good product from a bad product. That's going to do it for us, but make sure to tune in to Reporters Roundtable this weekend. David Cruz talks to Micah Rasmussen, director of the Rebovich Institute for New Jersey Politics at Ryder University, about the fallout from the historic ruling on the party line lawsuit. Then a panel of local reporters break down this week's political headlines. Watch it Saturday at 6 p.m. and Sunday morning at 10 on NJPBS. Then on Chatbox, David continues the party line conversation where he discusses is why some party leaders are still staunch supporters of that ballot system. That's Saturday night at 6.30 and Sunday morning at 10.30 on NJPBS. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. Enjoy the weekend. We'll see you back here on Monday. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And by the PSCG Foundation. Our future relies on more than clean energy. Our future relies on empowered communities, the health and safety of our families and neighbors, of our schools and streets. The PSEG Foundation is committed to sustainability, equity, and economic empowerment. Investing in parks, helping towns go green, supporting civic centers, scholarships, and workforce development that strengthen our community.